Tom Fisher sees changes throughout higher education. This conversation began with students, faculty, and teaching methods and moved to the challenges posed by the new on-demand economy. Well, I think that both the students and the faculty in higher education are changing dramatically. I think that uh, we've seen this flourishing of continuing education and the idea that the economy that we are now entering is one that really demands um, sort of continual learning. Um, and the old model of going to college, getting a degree, and then working your rest of your life to retirement is ending. And we're in an, increasingly in an economy where you will need to, we will all need to go back and uh, pick up new skill sets, new areas of knowledge repeatedly over our careers. And so we're going to see students coming back into institutions needing different kinds of knowledge uh, of all, sort of of all ages. And I think the same is true of faculty, interestingly enough. Again, the old model was that there was an established faculty and they were credentialed and they did all the teaching. And I think increasingly we're seeing that um, uh, just as the economy is turning us all into producers as well as consumers, that faculty are going to be students as well as teachers and teachers are going to become students. Students will be teaching. Um, there'll be a much more fluid relationship between who's a student and who's a teacher. Uh, at the same time, the whole model of the professor having all the knowledge is changing. I mean, higher ed has been dramatically disrupted by the internet, where the old model is you came into a classroom and took notes and somebody that had a lot of information conveyed it to you and you gave it back as a test. Now they can get that information faster and more accurate on the internet than the faculty member can pronounce it. And so it, it sort of undermines that old model and I think is leading to a new model of the teacher as a facilitator, a guide, a provocateur. Well, I think that um, I think one of the characteristics about this new economy, if some people call it the sharing, collaborative, or on-demand economy, is showing that um, increasingly people are living, working, making things in a much wider range of places and of spaces. And I think that one of the things that's happening is that the entire campus is becoming a kind of a learning environment. The entire city and region for these institutions is becoming the teaching environment. And the idea that we only do teaching in classrooms is, I think, going to be changing, I think the classroom will still have a role, but it won't be the only place that teaching will occur. In uh, the studio disciplines, there isn't necessarily a right answer. There's uh, a creative reformulation of the problem and the response to it. And I think that that is what our economy is going to want all of us to be doing, including the traditional liberal arts and the social sciences, is to uh, encourage people to think in completely new ways about their discipline. Well, I think the campuses that we've inherited from the past are way too big for um, what the new needs will be. And I know that sounds odd because it seems when you're on a campus that everyone's crying for more space. But um, we have a lot of uh, highly specialized space that goes unutilized or underutilized for large segments of the week. Um, the faculty office being m maybe one of the more notable ones where increasingly, if faculty are honest, they're basically carrying their office with them and their laptop and their cell phone. Um, and so this idea that you have to have this, this room set aside for yourself is a really antiquated idea. Um, the classroom is changing, um, and increasingly, if uh, uh, education is going to be happening, in a more pervasive way um, in locations potentially all over the globe or out in the community. Uh, we're going to see a changing use pattern of the classroom, which we're already seeing. Well, post-Einstein, we all know that you can't separate space and time. That, you know, certainly at the cosmic scale, space and time are a kind of singular and united continuum, and I, I actually believe that that's true at the scale of human interactions, too, that, um, and this has always been, I think, a, 
a shortcoming to our fields, architecture, urban design, uh, where we tend to see a space and we give it a name. This is a classroom, this is an office, this is a cafeteria, and we uh, don't think about those spaces uh, over time. And um, in, my, in our college, we actually did a kind of time map of space use, and it was fascinating, the, the number of gaps, the amount of space that was just kind of sitting around. Um, and so I think thinking about space in temporal terms uh, will also help us realize that we actually have a, an excess of space. And this is also part of the larger change that's happening in the economy. One of the things that I find interesting about the on-demand economy, the Airbnbs and the Ubers, for example, is that basically what they're saying is that we have way too many empty seats and cars. We have way too many bedrooms that are not being utilized on any given night. Uh, the new economy is squeezing a lot of the inefficiency out of the 20th century mass production, mass consumption economy that we've inherited. And I think the same thing is going to happen in universities. It's just a tremendous excess capacity of underutilized space depending on the time of day or time of week. And I think universities will do the same thing. The, and it will be forced to do this by the economy. It just makes no sense. So what would be an Airbnb equivalent in higher education? What would be an, Air, what would be an Uber equivalent in higher ed? It seems to me that those are the questions that campus planners need to start asking. This conversation was recorded February 8, 2016 in Minneapolis.